articulated title of this talk was Tom's, Tom Wolfe's America. And that's because that's the, the title, the preliminary title that I gave before I had decided actually, I thought, that's a big title. I, <laughs> whatever I say will we'll fit with that. Uh, but it could also be Tom Wolfe's America in search of the American story or in search of the American epic. On the one hand, the title seems imprecise or too broad, especially when one knows that Tom Wolfe has addressed himself to the full spectrum of social, cultural, and political themes in American life. Architecture, art, the space program, urban politics, race relations, the LSD hippie culture, the 60s, the 70s, the me decade, the wealth and self-appointed power of the business elites in the 80s and the 90s, not to mention the 21st century, neuroscience, evolution, and the continuing saga of the sexual revolution. Just so you know, I finished that sentence with a Tom Wolfe-esque exclamation mark. I had actually written that into my text before you said that. Um, but probably not four in a row. No. <laughs> um, but these are the particular case studies that comprise Wolfe's capacious written work. Wolf's literary canvas was America writ large, what he called the whole, and I quote, hulking carnival. Here it is helpful to consider Wolf's admiration for Sinclair Lewis, the great early 20th century American novelist. Wolf explains his veneration for Lewis in an essay he wrote for Harper's Magazine that he called a literary manifesto for a new social novel. Sinclair Lewis was the sort of writer and realistic novelist that Wolf aspired to be. Wolf explains that to write his novel, Elmer Gantry, Sinclair Lewis headed out to Kansas City to go beyond his personal experience in search of what the realistic novelist, the French realistic novelist Emile Zola called documentation, to immerse himself in the religious, cult, uh, the religious culture of the Midwestern United States. Sinclair Lewis was, in fact, the first American novelist to win the Nobel Prize for Literature. When Lewis accepted his award in Stockholm in 1930, he expressed, both a, he expressed a lament for the state of American literature. His concern was that in a country in which industry, finance, and science all flourish innovatively, American readers and writers were, quote, still afraid of any literature which is not a glorification of everything American. Sinclair Lewis called for an American literature that was a glorification, but of our faults as well as our virtues. The times have changed, even reversed course, to the point that in the year 2000, at the turn of the century, Tom Wolfe felt compelled to remind his readers that contrary to the opinions of those he identifies as intellectuals, a dangerous thing to say on a university campus, um, the United States was not the worst country in the world, according to Wolf, not, quote, a puritanical, repressive, bigoted, capitalist, and fascist nation beneath its democratic facade, but from his perspective, at least, a country that could boast of a freedom as well as a power unparalleled in the history of the world. At the end of his Nobel speech, Sinclair Lewis exhorted his fellow American novelists to give America a literature worthy of her vastness. Lewis's exhortation suggests that he possessed a strong sense of obligation to the people and the land of the United States to report on, to document, to tell their stories. And it is this literary duty that seems to have stuck with Tom Wolfe. Furthermore, Wolfe's literary duty to the United States also expresses itself as a kind of civic duty, the responsibility to tell the tale of America, but, as Sinclair Lewis demands, to tell it the truth about itself. My own attention to the writing of and thought of Tom Wolfe began as a passing interest after my first reading of his first novel, Bonfire of the Vanities. It struck me immediately that Wolf understood with penetrating acuity the landscape of urban American life, New York in particular, um, and perhaps above all, I was impressed with his capacity to pierce through the smug pretension and self-congratulatory character 
of American elites who hovered atop society, hardly deigning to look down from their Park Avenue penthouse perches to perceive the churning crowds of humanity beneath them as Wolf, as Wolf presented them. Clearly, here was the expression of the responsibility he assumed as a thoughtful journalist and writer to understand and report on American mores, the preferences of the elite and the pensions of the working and middle classes, the effects of money and power, but also American freedom and creativity on political life, class, and morality. Since then, I've read widely in Wolf, but it is this insight into the nature of American elites that has struck me, has stuck with me most of all. And I believe it is the key insight he offers that, that most illuminates the troubles, tensions that disturb American society even today. So it is not surprising that lately I have been thinking a lot about Tom Wolfe. And, and I am grateful for the opportunity afforded by Professor Lowenstein's invitation to speak this evening in the Center for the Liberal Arts and Free Institutions Fall Lecture Series to return to my reflections and work on Wolf. Um, as he mentioned, about four or five years ago, my husband and I were recruited to start a new school at Arizona State University, which has precluded me from um, doing that much writing. So I'm, I'm happy for the opportunity. So thank you. Um, as as Dan also mentioned, Wolf died in 2018, after the election of Donald Trump, but prior to the summer of racial protest and unrest following the murder of George Floyd. Before his death, he commented not so much directly on Donald Trump, but on men like him, who are crude, aggressive men, willing to do anything to get a deal done, the sort of men, and now women too, who, don't who we don't necessarily like, but who build cities like New York and countries like America. Wolf concedes there is something shameful about how Trump made or makes his money, but that in that way, he perfectly represents what, what Trump understood as, but sorry, what um, Wolf considers the American hero. Trump, Wolf continues in this interview, is a lot like Jay Gatsby. Both are nouveau riche thugs who lie about their age and their income throw parties for people who look down on them. And this sort of observation is what tugs me back to Wolf as a source for understanding our own times. I also do not know Wolf personally at all, but I have to say that I've been missing him lately. I would have liked to hear um, what he had to say about, about contemporary times. I miss his imperturbable, unflappable, serenely composed, ruthless, but somehow unfailingly charming way of piercing through affectation and revealing when self-importance is a cover for insecurity and overreach. Um, but it, but when, even when I'm missing him, I realize that what I just need to do is go back to his writing, um, because it's all there. Um, and I was thinking of this in particular because the other day I was listening to a podcast. Um, it was called Honestly by Barry Wise. And she was talking to, she was interviewing a young man whose name is Rob Henderson, a Cambridge University PhD student and public intellectual, a man who grew up in difficult childhood experience, uh, circumstances, impoverished sometimes. And Henderson has coined the phrase he calls luxury beliefs, a term he defines in this way. Luxury beliefs are ideas and opinions that confer status on the rich at very little cost while taking a toll on the lower classes. Um, and he gives examples, um, and I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about them because I've already got too much to say. Um, but defund the police or open borders or poly polyamory. Um, he says these are, these are examples of practices with which the rich can experiment with no great cost to themselves, but when they, when they trickle down um, to other people, they can be, they can be harmful. Um, whatever the examples are that we're talking about, um, specifically, the fact is that Rob Henderson's concept of luxury beliefs is straight out of Tom Wolfe. Um, he saw it coming in America in the 60s, and he chronicled it, cr chronicled it throughout the times. So let me explain what I mean. To the extent, and this is, and Tom Wolfe was not, he's not really 
I wouldn't say he was politically correct. Um, some people would accuse him of being on one side or the other, and he would always say that when they did that, and he challenged them to say what side he was on, they could never quite find, you know, muster the evidence to, to, to prove to him anyway that he was on one side or the other. So to the extent that Wolf sees himself as theoretical at all, he describes himself as what he calls a status theorist. And he, he understands himself, he says that he, under, he understands the examination of the ambitious vision for status as the basis for comprehending much human behavior. And apparently he gets this, he gets this from reading um, Weber. The study of status informs Wolf's observation of the way society functions. Status seeking and self-promotion is particularly prominent among social, economic, and political elites, particularly of the nouveau, of the, the new rich kind. Um, but his writing also investigates the way of life of ordinary Americans and the emergence of subcultures through which these individuals seek a different kind of distinction through self-expression outside of the traditional structure. Although Wolf says that everyone in democracy insists the idea, um, it resists the idea that status matters, he insists that status is fundamental, quote, an inescapable part of human life and that it is influential at every social and economic level of society. To understand individuals, Wolf contends, one must understand the societies of which they are members. For Wolf, society is composed of multiple status spheres, st status spheres or groups, and quote, the status group is the paramount social unit. Wolf believes that individual identity is largely defined by the status group. That is that you get your individual identity from everyone around you. Um, and he argues that it is the task of the status theorist, be he a journalist or a novelist, or both in the case of Tom Wolfe, to investigate and, quote, analyze the composite materials that form the status structure. He does perceive a difference, however, between what different status spheres value. And status spheres, Wolf is famous for his neologisms. He's always making up words, and there are words, it's not quite like Shakespeare, but um, there are words that we continue to use that, that Wolf brought into existence, into our vocabulary. Wolf observes that American elites seem to prize those activities and achievements, sets of beliefs, perhaps. He would like the term luxury beliefs, in fact, um, and material possessions that set them apart and even above the rest of Americans. Working in middle class Americans, he notes, seek to live comfortably and well, to be left alone and free to pursue happiness as they understand it. I can't help thinking of Machiavelli here. Um, Machiavelli's insight into the different humors of the aristocracy and the people um, in chapter nine of The Prince, his how-to book about how to gain power and keep it. Machiavelli's insight is that while everyone wants something, what people want, what the people, the or, more ordinary people want, is more decent. The nobles want the power to rule and oppress others, while the people want not to be oppressed. Um, I think Wolf would agree, actually. I think Wolf is saying something similar. I don't know how much Machiavelli he studied, but his assessment suggests that American elites are restless, in tension with, somehow dissatisfied with American democracy. While the American people are at large are more content to live their lives as well as possible if elites will just leave them alone. The context of Wolf's status inquiry is mostly post-World War I and II America, which he portrays in all its cultural, artistic, architectural, literary, intellectual, economic, social, political glory. Another exclamation mark, by the way. Um, while Europe lay, this is, and this is, you you can, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing when you write about Wolf, you start to, you start to acquire the cadence of his language in your own writing, or at least that happens to me. While Europe lay in smoldering ruins after the First and Second World Wars, Wolf liked to observe, the United States was, quote, um, now one of the great powers, young and on the rise, bursting with vigor and rude animal strength, health, 
It was, quote, the Rome of the 20th century, the very epicenter of wealth and power in the world. But it was not just Rome. The United States represented an entirely unique phenomenon. Wolf explains that the post-World War II boom pumped money into every level of the population, not every level, but a lot of, a lot of parts of the American population on a scale unparalleled in any nation in history. Still more, this great wealth, quote, this is another quote that, that Wolf liked to use, that would have made the Sun King blink, um, made it possible for the folks, ordinary Americans, to run, quote, wilder and freer than any people in history. And yet, with all this power and wealth, and this is where Wolf comments on um, American elites, with all this power and wealth, Wolf observes that there was um, a curious divide in the United States. He observes that American elites, the richest, and he's talking about the, the full scope of American elites, business, um, intellectual, artistic, um, the most well-educated, the cultural vanguard, um, are the least free, in his opinion. For they are mired in what Wolf calls, um, uh, borrowing from uh, another thinker, Calverton, a colonial complex, a great sense of inferiority to their European counterparts. In stark contrast, Wolf notes, the middling and the new working class were in the middle of a happiness explosion in, in the 20th century. On the whole, Wolf's discussion of status is the story of what he perceives as imitative pretension and timidity among elites, while the rest of America celebrated its liberty and prosperity. One might argue that prosperity is a superficial goal, but Wolf insisted that if you look at the history of humanity, prosperity is actually pretty good. <laughs> um, it's not a bad standard. So what, so how does Paul, well sorry, how does Wolf endeavor to explain this paradox of the elite status quest? For Wolf, American elites present an almost incomprehensible paradox. In a country that promises them freedom of thought and expression, he believed that they never nevertheless voluntarily subjected themselves to the ideas of others, specifically to the artists and intellectuals of Europe. Wolf introduces Calverton's understanding of the colonial complex in his introductory chapter to From Bauhaus to Our House, his, his exploration of the influence of Bauhaus architecture and the school of architecture on American, on American architecture and then on the American ethos um, after World War II. Wolf explains that after World War I, sorry, after World War I, I should say, after World War I, Wolf explains, young Americans flocked to Europe to learn how to be a European artist, as he says. The result, according to Wolf, was that the, arch the American architects, artists, and writers became enamored of the European artist and the European intellectual. And throughout his work, throughout Bauhaus, throughout the Painted Word, and many of his essays on the subject of American intellectuals, Wolf documents his perception, his understanding, of the submission of American elites to everything European. Um, I won't go through everything, but it's interesting to look at the Bauhaus uh, argument just as an example, um, or to, and to focus on that. Um, Wolf's discussion of Bauhaus, or the International School as it came to be called, um, which was a style of architecture and a philosophic approach to life that emerged in 1919, post-World War I, Germany, is interesting for, understand, for, for understanding Wolf's understanding of the relationship between elites and ordinary Americans and their, and, and their European and the European influence. According to Wolf, the intention of this architectural school was to rebuild European civilization up from the rubble, starting from zero. Um, and they would build schools and compounds around the new modern style of express structure. Um, that is, the structure was exposed for all to see and not hidden behind decorative false fronts. Flat roofs, the sheer facade, and honest materials, concrete, steel, wood, glass, stucco, 
that involved, uh, involved codes of thought and conduct that Wolf compares to medieval monastic life, and that gave the members, as Wolf perceived it, gave the members and their patrons a sense of exclusivity and superiority to the many uninitiated without. Wolf explains that behind the artistic intention of the Bauhaus school was ostensibly a socialist political manifesto that rejected all things bourgeois and turned their attention to serving the proletariat and the creation of perfect worker housing. The workers were considered intellectually underdeveloped and hence willing to let elites arrange their lives for them. All things decorative or colorful that were not functional were rejected as bourgeois. The result was an inviolable theory of architecture that tolerated no departure and no innovation. The impact of Bauhaus on American architecture was substantial, according to Wolf. Um, and, but from his perspective, it was, in his, in his opinion, entirely inapplicable to the United States in what he calls, quote, the American century. First of all, in the United States after the war, there was no need to start from zero. Um, as Wolf comments, somewhat ironically, quote, the sad truth was that the United States had not been reduced to rubble by the First World War. The United States was, quote, the richest nation in all of history so far, anyway. And again, I quote, in a period of, and this is the kind of language I think that Dan didn't like, a period of full-blooded, go-to-hell, belly-rubbing, wahoo, yahoo, youthful rampage. And what architecture has it to show for it, Wolf asks? Instead of a great show of, again, another list, quote, exuberance, power, empire, grandeur, or even high spirits and playfulness, America got austere architecture theory and worker housing. And how did Americans end up with so much architecture they detested? This is the question with which Wolf begins Bauhaus. Not even the workers, quote, incurable slubs that they were, um, again, Wolf ironically said, liked wor worker housing. Um, according to Wolf, they rejected its cold discomfort in favor of the suburbs where they could move and decorate, over decorate, um, to their heart's contents. Instead, it was the urban rich in America who accepted the 1950s Park Avenue box towers as luxury housing. Um, Wolf surmises that they were persuaded to accept Bauhaus functionalism and minimalism not because they liked it necessarily or because it was comfortable, but because it wasn't comfortable, um, but as a matter of, of fashion and social status. Sitting upon a 3,000 $465 Mia Spandero worker housing stainless steel and leather European international style chair elevated the wealthy into a rarefied stratosphere above the bourgeois rabble, according to Wolf. And yet this determination to be as non-bourgeois as possible was another European import that Wolf insists was utterly irrelevant to the United States. In a country with no monarchy or nobility to be toppled or reacted against, where nearly everyone considers himself, as I said, working or middle class, whether it's upper or lower or right in the middle, the Euro quote, the European concept of the bourgeoisie as a vulgar capitalist rebellious force, according to Wolf, was inapplicable. So why did the rich, the powerful, the intellectual, the artistic elite in America seek to avoid appearing bourgeois at all costs. Wolf concludes that although, quote, the eagle screamed its supremacy in the 20th century, American elites were still, were still insecure um, intellectually vis-a-vis -vis their European, their European um, their colleagues, you could say. Um, they rejected all things American, its vigor, optimism, and realism, as Wolf saw it, and, and saw, it as, saw America as hopelessly primitive and naive compared to the sort of sophistication of a European philosophy. In fact, Wolf wonders, Wolf is not impressed by American philosophy. Let's just, let's just leave it at that. 
um, in the 20th century. The implication of Wolf's argument is that American elites unconsciously considered themselves simple and unrefined in contrast to the perceived complexity and sophistication of their European counterparts. To embrace all things Amer European was to prove one's independence of ordinary vulgar American tastes and to assert one's elite status um, above, above the rabble, above everybody, above the bourgeois, bourgeoisie. Um, but in Wolf's view, and you know, he was he was Wolf was both a critic and un an unapologetic fan of America. He tried he put he tried to keep all of these things in his head and on the page all at the same time. Um, he perceived, he believed that they that they rejected what was problematic um, with what was also good and vibrant about the United States, along with um, and in favor of a stale, contemptuous civilization. So Wolf was not a great fan of, of Europe either, I guess, in contrast. Wolf, um, Wolf depicts in, um, sorry, Wolf applies parallel arguments to elites involved in modern art and intellectual life in America, all of whom were not much different from the Park Avenue elite um, Wolf depicts in Radical Chic. I don't know how many of you have read Radical Chic, but it's worth a look. Um, it was a it was a a story that Wolf wrote about um, this what he called a cause party in um, that was thrown by uh, Leonard and Felicia Bernstein in their um, Park Avenue apartment for the Black Panthers. Um, this elite that he depicts in Radical Chic um, supported radical but exotic, these, and these are Wolf's words, radical but exotic impossible causes like the Black Panthers because it endowed them, he thought, Wolf, Wolf thought, that they thought, it endowed them with a sense that they are dedicated and serious and possess the right moral sentiments. Um, they had become a kind of status type, according to Wolf. Um, does this criticism suggest that Wolf is anti-intellectual? Um, in Hooking Up, which is a book that he wrote in just at the turn of the century, or a collection of essays he put together, Wolf concludes his essay about 20th, 20th century intellectual life in America by imagining that, quote, if only God were not dead, and Nietzsche uh, were looking down today upon his contemporary counterparts from a cloud in heaven, Quote, he would have grown weary of their dogged skepticism, cynicism, irony, and contempt, unquote, and he would have accused them of choosing, quote, a facile snobbery over the hard work, the endless work, the Herculean work of gaining knowledge. For Wolf, the real emptiness in American life consists in the decline in the serious moral and intellectual quest for knowledge necessary to maintain a healthy self-governing republic. In contrast to elites, Wolf was kind of a fan um, of, of the kind of freedom that allowed um, the Amer Americans who were sort of newly prosperous um, to go out and find their way and to have fun, I guess you could say. Um, it's important to note that Wolf himself is no gloomy pessimist. He delights in pointing out that while American elites were vainly endeavoring to transcend what they perceived as their mundane bourgeois country to insulate themselves from the mob, the mob was quite unaware of the snub and faring very well. Um, Wolf explains that the status quest um, had always involved asserting authority, observing esoteric status lines, making symbols, symbolic gestures of rank, of living with snobbery, and that this just didn't appeal to ordinary Americans um, on, on the whole. Um, and they'd become pretty wealthy since World War II. They had the financial security and possessions necessary to compete in the old status system inherited from Europe, the grand, grander looking homes, cars, big lawns, well-dressed children, rugs in every room, unquote. 
But to their credit, Wolf argues, they lack the talent and inclination for it. Wolf's explanation of this new middle class's reaction to the old European style status competition is that, quote, it makes one feel not snobbish, but curiously insecure to work so diligently to assert one's status. While the elites of America felt sorely inferior to the Europeans in all matters of taste and intellect, ordinary Americans experienced no such insecurity. Um, they, I think I might just, um, Wolf's point essentially is that ordinary Americans dropped out of the status competition. Um, they became status, what he called status dropouts. Um, that's the term. And his, the greatest status, I, I sort of took, had to take this section out, but one, one essay that he writes um, in, in one of his collections of essays is about Hugh Hefner, who he said was the greatest status dropout of all. Um, of course, Hugh Hefner is not very politically correct these days at all, so um, I'll leave it for you to go and find that essay and read about it on your own. Um, much of Wolf's work in the 60s catalogs these alternative status spheres, as he calls them. Southern California was a veritable, and here we are in Southern California, was a veritable mecca for these new status groups, the surfers, the pompadour hair boys, hot rodders and rock and roll kids, not to mention the merry pranksters and the LSD um, uh, sort of crowd with which uh, Wolf spent some time. All up and down the coast from Los Angeles to Baja, California, kids could go to one of these beach towns and live the complete surfing life. And Wolf says that retired folks did this, this too. The 65 plus dro crowd dropped out, purchased trailer homes, and joined a newly formed status group of independent, retired, nomadic, free, caravanning grandparents. Um, Wolf makes clear, however, that this was just the first stage of the quest for, for greater freedom. Once ordinary Americans possessed the means to pursue it, the next level was the search for self-expression in what Wolf calls the me decade and the third great awakening, the 70s and new religious revival. So how did carefree independence and the desire for self-liberation and fulfillment become the me encounter movements, the me decade. Um, I had a cousin who grew up in California, and I remember when we were kids, she would tell me she went to encounter groups, like we were 10. And she would say she went to teen encounter. And I said, what do you do at teen encounter? She said, we talk about how we feel. And I'm Canadian. I thought, what, you talk about how you feel? <laughs> Just, people don't do that, do they? <laughs> anyway, um, Wolf's argument is that the wealth of the post-war era also produced the me decade. Wolf is well aware that the least well-off were unaffected by the post-war prosperity and that social and racial troubles abounded at this time. Um, I did not write about, <laughs> um, I did not write, I could have included here a long discussion of Radical Chic and Mamo and the Flat Catchers and Wolf's treatment of race across his essays and his novels, but I just couldn't write about everything, so that's for another paper, another chapter. Um, so he's, he's well aware of those things, and he writes about them extensively. But he insists that Americans, as I said, at, every, at nearly every economic level, with better lives material than in most places in the world in most historic periods. Whereas 19th century utopian socialists believed that industrialism together with socialism would produce the circumstances that, quote, would give the common man the things he needed in order to realize his potential as a human being, surplus discretionary income, political freedom, free time, leisure, and freedom from grinding drudgery, it turns out, Wolf observes, that a go-getter bourgeois business boom made possible, quote, the day of the liberated working man. But as the so-called socialist Bauhaus architects discovered, the newly liberated common man was uncooperative. He refused to take the guidance of elites. He took the money and he ran, determined to realize his potential on his own. Um, in the 70s, the hippie surfer breakout status spheres of the earlier decade became introspective. 
um, according to Wolf. Historically, Wolf explains, it had been a luxury of the rich to devote their long leisure hours and surplus income to, quote, remaking, remodeling, elevating, and polishing one's very self, and observing, studying, and doting on it. And then in, you know, in big letters, me, with maybe several exclamation marks, um, to avoid the blatant vanity of such narcissistic pastimes, Wolf remarks the aristocracy was always careful to endow them with a moral purpose of some sort. The chivalric tradition was ostensibly devoted to the high principles of virtue, um, honor, and beauty. But Wolf insists that what the knights and ladies really enjoyed was the satisfaction of, quote, dwelling upon me and every delicious nuance of my conduct and personality. Prosperity and the free time it created made this possible for ordinary Americans. Eventually, not only the young and the old were breaking away, but indeed everyone was heading to California in pursuit of self-discovery. They would travel to these institutes and attend marathon um, encounter groups where during long hours together they were, quote, engaged to bear their souls and strip away one another's defensive facade. Facing one's emotions head on was required. Ideas of private sentiments and virtuous self-control were abandoned. The appeal, according to Wolf, was simple enough to understand the life of each encounter participant became a drama with universal significance. Clearly, middle and working class Americans had enough material comfort and security for leisure time. And not all as religious, as traditionally religious as they once were, they cast around for some higher source of fulfillment, some further satisfaction um, of the needs of the soul. Wolf argues that the secular slogan of the me decade derived from something some of you may remember. Um, a Clairol hair commercial, television commercial, became, um, if I've only one life, let me live it as a blonde. Or, and then Wolf puts it in big, <laughs> again, lots of exclamation marks, me. Um, and each individual became so self-absorbed, so concerned with fulfilling his own potential, Wolf suggests, that he or she gave up on what he calls, quote, man's age-old belief in serial immortality. Ideas of sustaining ancestral traditions, soldiers sacrificing for their countries or parents sacrificing for their children were abandoned in favor of self-realization. Emotional honesty, sexual liberation, and even spiritual fulfillment took precedence over the preservation of family and society. Americans were in a fully self-indulgent mood. Wolf reminds us, um, and he does explicitly refer to the ubiquitous, he calls him Alexis de T, um, Alexis de Tocqueville, that Tocqueville observed the potential dangers of individualism in American life long, long ago in democracy in America. Tocqueville saw, quote, quote from Wolf, um, the American sense of equality as disrupting the stream, which he called time's pattern. Not only does democracy make each man forget his ancestors, it hides his descendants from him and divides him from his contemporaries. It continually turns him back into himself and threatens at last to enclose him entirely in the solitude of his own heart. Wolf agrees with Tocqueville about the destructive potential of individualism for the family and the fabric of society. Yet his reaction to this danger is ambivalent, strangely maybe. Partly this is due to Wolf's resistance to the dreary depiction of the middle class by American intellectual elites, or elites in general. What Wolf can't abide is the morose condescension of these elites towards ordinary Americans and American life in general. Their vision of modern man is that of a sad, alienated victim, quote, a helpless, bewildered, and dispirited slave of modern economic life, who requires above all their instruction. Wolf insists, however, that the elite analysis of the American middle classes is exactly wrong. Instead of hanging their heads in despair, the American middle classes
Wolf declares, quote, created the greatest age of individualism in American history. Wolf cannot help celebrating the American spirit of freedom and innovation, even while he is describing it at its most shallow and self-indulgent. And this is, at least partly, because he sees the possibility of self-correction in the quest for self-fulfillment and the pursuit of the inner divine spark. Um, Wolf perceives a desire for a less material, more spiritual life among Americans. And as a result of the sweeping aside of the standards characteristic of moral behavior in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, Wolf anticipated a relearning of moral values and a rediscovery of ethics in, in the future, in the new millennial to, millennium to come. I still wonder what he might say, but I'm, I have I have another 10 pages or seven or eight pages here, but about about Wolf's novels. Um, but I, I wonder if I should sort of end it there and then let you ask me questions about it, and, and then I'll be happy to to answer them. Thank you. of what you just said about the remaining seven or eight pages, um, can you sort of, in a summary way, indicate, do you think that the novels were simply a continuation of the same themes uh, for Wolf, uh, just in a through a different medium, or uh, did they reflect some uh, different outlook on, on these things, or at least some variation? Um, I, think, I think it does some of, some of both. Um, the Right Stuff, for example, which is not a novel, but Wolf's first sort of novel-length uh, work of nonfiction about the Apollo astronauts and about the, um, he says that he started because he was interested in the astronaut program, but in fact he became more interested in the test pilots. Um, and they were the ones uh, from whom they chose the astronauts, and they are the ones where he perceived what he calls the right stuff. Um, those with the kind of courage, there's a great quote I have somewhere, um, and, and he says, although, oh, where is it? Um, the best military pilots and the astronauts he interviewed had, quote, the physical courage and manly honor he sees little of elsewhere. Wolf insists the composite materials of what he calls the right stuff were current, raw courage, confidence, self-control, steely, unalterable determination, and patriotic duty. The qualities were demonstrated by the daily willingness and the ability, quote, to go up in a hurtling piece of machinery and put his hide on the line and then have the moxie, the reflexes, the experience, the coolness, to pull it back in the last yawning moment, and ultimately, in its best expression, to do it, do so in a cause that means something to thousands, to a people, to a nation, to humanity, to God. Um, so in the right stuff, what Wolf saw in these human beings was a kind of, yeah, they love to fly, right? They love, they love airplanes and they love to fly, but they also saw that they had a bigger purpose, a purpose um, that, a patriotic purpose, a purpose that um, that made them one with um, a kind of national aspiration for honor and exploration, and and I think that Wolf is lamenting that kind of human being, and and I, I have a whole account again, like I have a lot of chapters, um, a lot of papers, a whole account of Wolf's women as well. In fact, the right stuff begins with an account of the bravery of the women married to these, um, these test pilots who had to just wonder every time they saw, you know, a puff of sleep, they saw a plane up in smoke if it was their husband and, and how, how would they live with it. Um, but, but there's a kind, of, a kind of human being that we admire, that we look up to, and Wolf was starting to worry that that sort of human being was disappearing. And his portrayal of Sherman McCoy in Bonfire of the Vanities, I think, is a, is a portrayal of the kind of human being that, 
that Wolf is afraid that we'll all become <laughs> in a society where we value too much. Um, he's, he, he's, he's a fan of capitalism. He thinks it creates wealth and prosperity for Americans across the, across the spectrum. And of course, this is the 20th century. I mean, he, he was only just peering at globalization and the kind of havoc it might wreck with this, this part of, of American humanity. But he, but he, he was, but he, but he, but he sees Sherman McCoy, and he compares. So Sherman McCoy is, is Wolf's protagonist in Bonfire of the Vanities, and he's a bond trader, and he's made a lot of money, but he's also spent more than he's made. Um, and Wolf compares him to his father. His father is the kind of guy who made a lot of money on Wall Street. He took the subway every day to work because he didn't want to separate himself too much from the rest of the people. He came up from the people, some, he came up somewhere from the south, I think, and, um, and, he, and he became a New Yorker and he made his fortune. But, but, you, you, but Wolf tells us this one scene, gives us this one scene where he contrasts Sherman McCoy with his father. Sherman takes his little girl to school um, and he leaves her at school and he's tempted to get on the subway, but instead he says, no, I have to isolate, isolate, isolate. And, gets, and he gets in a taxi and makes his way up to um, his office as a bond trader and he just forgets everything in the moment of making money. Um, and there's just a kind of pettiness, a kind of smallness. He calls himself, he thinks of himself as a master of the universe when he's making all this money, but but Wolf, but Wolf is mocking him, um, and and what's interesting is that the next novel, and of course, life doesn't go well for Sherman McCoy. I mean, it's a, to tell the story of Bonfire of the Vanities is is probably beyond my scope here. But the next novel is a, is called A Man in Full, and here. Well, it takes us down to the south, right? And you have this great developer uh, from Atlanta, a, a man who had uh, made a fortune also, but he just, he built one too many buildings. Um, and his wife says that he did it because he had, he was, his ex-wife says he did it because he was involved with, uh, he had started his affair with his young, another wolf theologism, uh, uh, trophy wife, um, and he wanted to impress her. Uh, and and he, he was going broke, um, and he didn't know how to get himself out of it. And, um, and he, has, he has an offer from, from the mayor of, of Atlanta that would, would sort of save his fortune, but it would compromise him, it, would compromise, it could compromise his integrity. Um, and in the, so he goes and he has a knee replacement to escape the, to, to delay the decision. And in the meantime, this young man, Conrad, um, comes in as a health worker and supports him. And Conrad had been in prison, it's a long story also, but he had been given, he'd asked for a book and instead somehow, somehow he got Epictetus, somehow he got Stoicism. And, and it's, not a, it's not a surprise that Wolf is looking for, he wants to infuse into his protagonist a kind of moral integrity, a kind of understanding that you need to do the right thing, you need to figure out what the right thing is and do it. Um, and that, I don't think it's a, mis I don't think it's a, a kind of, a mis uh, uh, I don't think that Wolf does this by accident. I don't think it's an accident that he reaches back to, to an ancient time for a standard of humanity and morality, um, and that and that might raise a question for us: Do we does that is Wolf saying that liberalism can't stand on its own? That that liberal democracy can't stand on its own? That it needs a kind of ancient, or it needs a supplement from somewhere? And he might be saying that, but I think he's also saying that liberal democracy is flexible enough um, to draw from sources. Uh, that make it stronger. Um, he's not he's not a fan of a fixed um, kind of regime that that can't adapt itself. He's not saying change the constitution, but 
but ideas can reinforce principles that we need for sort of reinstilling healthy institutions. So, so I think the novels both offer um, further sort of uh, examples um, and stories of the problems that emerge from from Americans kind of turning away from their civic their civic lives um, and being intro becoming introspective, um, getting religion getting getting um, a certain kind of religion, um, but but also but I don't think I don't think Wolf loses his optimism about the the sort of promise um, of American democracy. Who is the man in full? <laughs> No, sir. Right. No, I, I think that that's a really good question. Um, I think that the man in full could be could be it could be several people, right? It could be Charlie Croker. It could be the man in full being the protagonist, his protagonist, but that he doesn't become the man in full until the end of the novel, when he understands that that he's become in a way the motif of the novel is a man in prison, right? That Conrad is really in prison. <laughs> yeah. um, and then there's this serendipitous earthquake that breaks open the prison, and he escapes with his copy of the Stoics and makes his way to Atlanta and meets Charlie. But Charlie Croker is also a man imprisoned. And he comes to understand that he's imprisoned by these expectations of um, status seeking and wealth and um, and that there's a different kind of honor that should matter more. Um, and so he doesn't become a man in full um, until he becomes, um, until he understands what it is to be, to be a man um, and to, to care about what one should care about, as opposed to caring about, um, to care about his real honor and virtue, as opposed to his wealth and power and mistresses and so on. Um, so, I mean, it could be Conrad, but it, I, it could be Conrad who's the real man in full in a way, but I don't think so. I think maybe it, do you, who do you think it is? Who do you think it is? Oh, well, I've had trouble, you know, thinking about it. Yeah. Um, to me, it's more Conrad, actually. Yeah. yeah. Um, because, as I say, a Frogger, Frogger, uh, when he finds you know, some truth, ends up, you know, some TV personality, right. <laughs> the evangelist, you know, I mean, so it's a little iffy. But the program is following him around. Two, yeah. Way. I mean, I think I think that's right. I, I, I do think it could be Conrad, because Conrad is the one who reads the Stoics and ex it's not clear that Croker ever, Charlie Kroger ever reads anything himself, so that could be the possibility that he's the that, that that I mean probably he does, but Conrad seems to sort of give him lectures almost, right? And so so it's possible it's possible that it's Conrad, but I, I think that um, Wolf presents him as this kind of manly specimen, Croker as this manly specimen, um, and then we see that he's not really manly at all uh, because he's enslaved to his reputation and what he thinks he's supposed to do. So I haven't really answered your question. I've just given you the same alternatives you've been debating. Yep. Um, do you think the um, identity politics that preoccupy a lot of people today is another expression or a, more, or, or a contemporaneous expression of the self Preoccupation with the self, and that is a newfangled form of the me-ism being decade, and what would Wolf say about that, do you think? Well, I mean, it, it, that, that, my essay sort of begs, like, begs someone to ask that question, I think, um, because that's, that's obvious. Well, I think that's obviously what I've been thinking about. Um, and Wolf, I think Wolf saw this coming way, 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 way back. Um, and, and he, and I mean, you just have to. You, I don't know if you've read Radical Chic, but it's 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 just uh, devastating, really. Um, but so is Mao Mao and the Flat Catchers, because 
his point is that it becomes this kind of strange, for Wolf, you know, Wolf's perception of it is it becomes, instead of being um, a serious case for development and change, and um, it becomes a strange game. Um, and 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 I think I think Wolf, I sort of, I do wish Wolf were around to write about it, but I sort of think he already has, right? And um, and he was just writing about it a long time ago and seeing it coming. It's another kind of prism, is it? Is it be consistent? I, I I think he it doesn't might doesn't liberate anyone, perhaps. I, I think he might say that. Um, I I think I think he he might see that um, because. Because he 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 sees this as a kind of quest for power. Um, I think that it's not an accident again that he brings Nietzsche into the story. Um, but he sort of but what he what he does is turn Nietzsche against. He's like, you're not understanding me. <laughs> um, <laughs> you're taking this too far. Um, now what? I'm not sure that's right, but but that's Wolf's Wolf's point is that even Nietzsche would become um, impatient with those who understand themselves. And this is in an essay about Stanley Fish and, um, and all kinds of um, contemporary um, thinkers. But, um, but I, think, I think Wolf really does see the seeds of this coming. And he sees it in the 60s, and he writes about it consistently. Um, and it's in every novel. Uh, it's in every story. At the end of. Um, bonfire of the Vanities, when Sherman McCoy has just been released from prison because he, the um, Mar Marvin Kavitsky, um, the judge says, look, this is all manufactured. This, the, there's no evidence to support these charges that you've brought. Um, Sherman McCoy looks around and he's like, he's wearing a sweater and jeans. He's completely dressed down at this point. He's not wearing his fancy Brooks Brothers suits or whatever he was wearing. And he does a kind of black power salute. Um, and he's just, it's completely trivialized. Um, it's just a kind of, it's just something he acquired at college that he's reaching, reaching out for now that he's completely lost, he's completely lost his way, but he doesn't, the point is, I think the point is that Charlie Kroger sort of at least finds something of substance with through Conrad and through Stoicism, but Sherman McCoy doesn't, it's not clear he's learned anything. Um, it's, I think that's what Wolf is, is trying to tell us at the end. It seems to suggest that the Wolf doesn't necessarily share all the attitudes and expectations of other intellectuals or writers, and that he's a little more independent in that way. What was there about his background or, or whatever that you think kind of fostered that independence uh, of spirit? Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting question um, because Wolf talks about when he went to school, so. You know, Wolf is from the South, first of all. Let's put it that like Wolf is from a kind of conservative South. He goes to Washington and Lee as an undergraduate. Um, he wants to be a baseball player, but he doesn't make it. <laughs> he doesn't make it. And so he so what do all baseball players who don't make it do? The, he goes to do a PhD in American Studies at Yale. Um, um, so, um, so you know that love of baseball and love of ideas. <laughs> Um, and and at Yale, I think even you know this is this is way back in in you know the early it's the early fifties I think it's the early fifties um, and he is late forty late forties early fifties or I think it's the fifties and he is and he is sort of mortified um, and he and he describes a kind of um, a kind of it's this strange kind of elitism at Yale, which is I haven't been to Yale, so I'm not going to say anything. Um, but uh, that he, with which he disagrees, um, and what he sees is this strange thing happening, which is everyone that used to be that at Yale, everyone was wearing. Um, the right shirt, the right button-downs, and the right 
um, and there was a certain kind of um, sort of preppy fashion. And then he notices that the fashion changes. Um, everyone's wearing jeans and, um, and lumberjack shirts, and so this same elite has just gone to what he calls funky chic. <laughs> well, no, that's not funky chic. Funky chic is the sort of very, very high fashion of the kind of um, you know, black Americans um, on the other block. But you see this kind of dressing down um, that's happened. And, and, and Wolf is watching all of it. And somehow he's, somehow he's sort of holding himself back as an observer of these things, as opposed to a participant. Um, and it's the same thing with the white suit, by the way. And he goes to New York, finally, he gets a job, he goes to write in New York, and he buys a white suit, but it turns out to be too heavy to wear in the summer. So he wears it in the winter. Mm -hmm. And somehow, he, this is the story he tells anyway, and, he, and people find it alarming. Like, you're wearing a white suit in the winter. That's wrong. It's just funny, you know, it's breaking all the rules. And, and somehow he just likes it. <laughs> he likes how uncomfortable it makes everyone, and so he adopts it, and he just starts wearing a white suit always. And so, you know, with the fancy tie and the spats and the whole thing, and, and I think it is, so I think it's just partly his, his, his education, um, his, a kind of, it, it is his, there's something about the desire to watch and observe. Um, this is the way he talks about his journalism and his writing. And there's, again, there's another whole book about that, which is that, that he understands himself as an observer um, of, of, of humanity. Um, and you know, we, could, we could argue about whether he takes sides um, because, because he, He's willing to skewer pretty well everyone, I think. Um, but he, but he's also, um, but he's also um, sort of standing back and observing the way people behave and trying to figure out, you know, why they behave that way. And for him, he even—it's interesting. At certain points, he differentiates himself from historians. It's not that he doesn't provide historical context for what he says. Um, he loves to compare um, American elites in the 60s and the 70s, mostly the 60s, 70s also, I guess, um, to, um, to the French aristocracy um, who had what he called a nostalgie de la boue. Um, they loved to sort of dress down um, and um, sort of try to uh, express a kind of sympathy with the lower classes um, by dressing down and um, kind of trying to recover from, the aristocracy don't do this, but American elites do it, have this problem with um, trying to, to recover from the sin of too much money, for example. Um, but um, I think he just, I think he, he said, and then he says, well, historians will have to look back and try to sort of put this in context. Is the new left movement, he says, just a religious revival? Um, which maybe answers your question as well. I don't know if that answers your question. I'm not sure if I can give you um, a, a, a complete answer to the question, but. It might not be that easy, because other people in that same background, maybe also at Yale, you know, did in that so yeah. you can put people in the same environment and they can come out very differently. So. It's a kind of critical thinking. Yeah. I mean, he, he engages a kind, in a kind of critical thinking. Rather, he, he's a con he, you could also say he's something of a contrarian. Um, he just doesn't go the way that everyone else goes. And that might disprove his rule. <laughs> that might disprove his status um, group theory rule, which is that, that uh, the individual is the result of, of the status group, that the individual is completely absorbed by and influenced by and becomes the product of a status group. But on the other hand, he also says there are status dropouts, you know, those who see the problems with the status group and stand apart and, and, and try to remain a, uh, apart from it because they see the problems with it. So 
and you know he might be a status dropout. <laughs> Although you know he had his own status. <laughs> I mean, a guy who wears white suits everywhere he goes, right? <laughs> He's got to care about. He just he wanted to, he, the the white suit was like poking someone in the eye. Um, it made them feel uncomfortable, and so he just kept doing it. Okay, Carol, just thank you so much.